Welcome everyone to History Gone Wilder, part of Half History Will Travel. I'm your host, the Wilder historian, Dr. Lucas Wilder, and last time I animated the fight between A.P. Hill and Winfield Scott Hancock. Now, both armies prepare through the night of May 5th and into the morning of the 6th, deciding on what strategy they would employ for the next day's fight. If you like what I do, please consider subscribing to the channel if you haven't done so already, join the Patreon page, or purchase something from the Teespring store or Etsy shop. Every little bit helps. Thank you. A North Carolinian from Hill's Corps described the first day's fight as such. A butchery, pure and simple, it was, unrelieved by any of the arts of war in which the exercise of military skill and tact robs the hour of some of its horrors. It was a mere slugging match in a dense thicket of small growth, where men but a few yards apart fired through the brushwood for hours, ceasing only when exhaustion and not commanded a rest. A man from Lewis Grant's Vermont Brigade wrote, Oh, you have no idea of the scenes we are passing through. Tongue can never tell the suffering, the hardships, the alternate rising of hope and fallen of hope. The successes of the battle are various, though we have made steady gain from the first, which, if our men last, will give us the victory in the end. Ulysses S. Grant sat at his headquarters that night and said, I feel pretty well satisfied with the result of the engagement, for it is evident that Lee attempted by a bold movement to strike this army in flank before it could be put into line of battle and be prepared to fight to advantage, but in this he has failed. However, Grant realized that James Longstreet's corps for Lee and Ambrose Burnside's corps for himself had not made it to the field. With fresh troops coming to the side of the fighting, more bloodshed would happen the next day. Grant's strategy was for Winfield Scott Hancock and his 2nd Corps, along with Getty's division from the 6th Corps, to attack A.P. Hill's Corps and drive it back, defeating it before Longstreet could make it to the field. The 5th and 6th Corps under Governor K. Warren and John Sedgwick would hold Yule in place so that Robert E. Lee couldn't shift troops to Hill's front. Hancock's attack was initially scheduled for 4.30 a.m., but Meade and some other generals convinced Grant to extend the time in order for Burnside to make it to the field. Burnside's corps was one of the key components for the fighting on May 6th. The 9th Corps would take up a position in the Union Center, with one division being sent to Hancock to be used as a reserve. Lee put forward his plan for the night and the next day. Hill would move his corps north to link up with Ewell, while Longstreet came up and took the place of Heath and Wilcox's division. But Hill didn't prepare his men for the next day, just in case Hancock renewed the attacks. Why remains uncertain. If Hill did fill out a report, it has been lost. Heath's account remains the only good source on the situation, but his is suspect because it appears his intention was solely to absolve himself of blame. Heath claimed that he and Wilcox approached Hill to ask that their lines be reformed. Hill waved it off and said reforming in darkness so close to the enemy's lines was dangerous, and leaving the area meant leaving the wounded, so they should stay where they were. Hill added, Longstreet, will be up in a few hours. He will form in your front. I don't propose that your division will do any fighting tomorrow. The men have been marching and fighting all day and are tired. I do not wish them disturbed. Allegedly, Heath came to Hill three times, requesting to reform the lines, and on the last one, Hill angrily stated, Heath, I don't want to hear any more about it. I don't want them disturbed. In that respect, Hill was just following Lee's orders for his men to rest until Longstreet arrived to relieve them. Heath also made a ridiculous claim that he spent two hours searching for General Lee to go over Hill's head and claimed he could not find the army commander. The reason for this ridiculousness was Lee's headquarters sat right behind Heath's division, and Lee was in his tent all night, so Heath's story remains highly suspect. Ewell on the Confederate left was more active in aligning his troops from the day's fight. He switched brigades around and filled gaps in the line where needed. Although numerous Union brigades attacked his front, for the most part, his line held, and he threw back any blue troops. He also massed his artillery around Saunders Field and on each flank, where they could be used most effectively. Around 5 a.m. on the Union right, heavy skirmishing erupted between the forces north of Saunders Field, but no major attacks were made. The Union commander, George Meade, wanted Warren to make a vigorous attack against the Confederate line on the Orange Turnpike to prevent reinforcements to be sent from Ewell's line to Hill's but Warren wouldn't budge. His skirmishers did move out, but no substantial attack was made. As Warren delayed, Burnside's corps was marching to the Union Center. Hancock, hearing that Burnside was delayed in getting to him, 
due to fires and clogged roads, grew angry, but was going to press on with his orders anyway. Hancock had worked tirelessly through the night to construct a battle line that was deep rather than wide. That way, proper support would be given to the front line. Wadsworth's division, with Henry Baxter's brigade of Robinson's division, was also on Hill's left flank, and poised for an attack as well. At a little after 5 a.m., the signal gun went off, signaling for Hancock's men to advance. The blue-coated soldiers pushed on through the dense vegetation toward the enemy. Many of the bushes and small trees had been cut down to around two and a half feet due to the gunfire from the previous day, so the men moved through with a little more ease than the day before. When they made contact with the rebels, the enemy fired one volley and then began to break. Scales' brigade was one of the few intact brigades that gave any resistance, but with so many others around them falling back, they wouldn't engage with the Federals long. It wasn't long before Hill's two divisions were in full retreat toward the Widow Tap field. The only thing standing in the way of Hancock's 2nd Corps was the success that led to regiments, brigades, and divisions becoming entangled, especially the front line, and the 16 artillery pieces assembled in the Tap field by William Pogue. Pogue remembered, Closer and closer the uproar came, and I directed our men to pile up rails, logs, etc., at each gun for protection from bullets that now came constantly our way. The Federal soldiers caught up to many of the fleeing rebels and yelled for them to come behind their lines. They held their fire until those who wanted to surrender made it safely behind the battle line. A staff officer from General Meade came to Hancock at the intersection of the Orange Plank Road and the Brock Road. Hancock was overjoyed, he said, Tell General Meade we are driving them beautifully. Bernie has gone in, and he has just cleaned them out beautifully. The staffer informed Hancock, I was ordered to report only one division of Burnside up, but he would attack as soon as he could. Hancock replied, I knew it, just what I expected. If he could attack now, we could smash A.P. Hill all to pieces. Although Hancock's troops met with great success against Hill's men, his battle lines were now intermingled. One of his aides described the situation. Great gaps appeared in the line. Men and even officers had lost their regiments in the jungle. The advance had not been, could not have been, made uniformly right to left, and the line of battle ran here forward and there backward, through the forest. Thousands had fallen in the furious struggle. The men in front were largely out of ammunition. One of those Federal soldiers said, We had to break up into squads and march by the flank. Regiments would thus become separated from brigades and brigades from divisions and when the attempt was made to re-establish a line, numerous gaps existed. Hill tried mostly in vain to get soldiers to reform. It was no use. By this point, no cohesiveness existed. Hill directed Pogue to fire double canister over the heads of the retreating Confederates at the Union troops pushing through the tree line. His staff worried that the artillery might hit wounded soldiers on the ground, but Hill simply stated, the guns must open fire. Hill, the former artilleryman he was, began helping to load and fire the pieces at the Federal soldiers. Lee himself tried to rally Hill's troops retreating through the Widow Tap field. He came to General McGowan and said, My God, General McGowan, is this splendid brigade of yours running like a flock of geese? McGowan responded, General, the men are not whipped. They only want a place to form and will fight as well as they ever did. Union troops were now showing themselves through the trees. The artillery was keeping them at bay but it wouldn't be long before the blue lines began coming in waves to overrun the 16 Confederate cannons. Lee was now incredibly worried. He told Cadmus Wilcox, one of Hill's division commanders, to ride along the Orange Plank Road that Longstreet must be here. Go bring him up. It wasn't long after Lee sent Wilcox on his mission that he saw a group of men in formation heading east along the Plank Road. Lee asked, Who are you, my boys? The reply came, Texas boys. Hood's old Texas brigade, now under Brigadier General John Gregg, was now on the field. Lee took off his hat, waved it in the air, and yelled, Hoorah for Texas! Hoorah for Texas! The Texans deployed for battle in the Widow Tap field, with Lee close at hand. When the new arrivals saw their army commander so close, they told him, Go back, General Lee! Go back! When Lee continued to follow them, they began to say, We won't go unless you go back. Lee's aide, Charles Venable, made his appearance and informed the commander that Longstreet was needing orders. Lee turned his trusted horse traveler around and rode to Longstreet. An Alabamian in William F. Perry's brigade, which was two brigades behind Gregg's Texans, described the scene. Directly in our front, as we were hastening forward, the sun, blood red from the effect of the smoke of battle, was just appearing above the wilderness. Litter bearers were continually passing with the severely maimed, and a stream of wounded 
able to leave the battle line, filled both sides of the plank road. I never before or after witnessed such excitement and confusion. It was perfectly appalling. Staff officers were urging their mounts at topmost speed back and forth. Orders were repeatedly received for us to quicken our steps. The number of wounded and stragglers increased as we drew nearer the firing line, all stating that we were holding our own, unwilling to acknowledge that disaster had befallen them. Despite Lee seeing and interacting with the Texans first, the first brigade to reach the field was Joseph Kershaw's old brigade of South Carolinians, now under John Kennedy. They would file to the right of the Orange Plank Road. The Texans and South Carolinians advanced against the confused ranks of the successful Union regiments. Gregg's men stood 20 yards away from the enemy, with both sides firing volleys into one another. After only a short time, Gregg's brigade dwindled from around 800 men to just 250, losing nearly two-thirds of his command. They fell back, but another brigade, that under Henry Benning, was right behind to take their place. On the right, Kennedy's line drifted south, opening up a gap in the line. Joseph Kershaw, the division commander, would fill it with Benjamin Humphrey's Mississippians. Even though the Union lines were a confused mass, they were still able to defend themselves excellently. Their bullets found their marks, indicated by the fact that both Benning and Kennedy were wounded in the action, with John Hennigan taking over Kennedy's brigade and Dudley DeBose took over the command of the Georgians. The openness of the ground led the Union bullets finding more targets in the Georgians' ranks. Behind DeBose was the brigade of William Perry, full of Alabamians. He had time to form up his brigade properly before setting off. General Lee, watching as the Confederates dressed their lines in preparation for the assault, commented, God bless the Alabamians. When Benning pulled back, Perry's men went in with a rebel yell, pushing back more Union soldiers. Before he stepped off, Perry was told to keep his right on the Orange Plank Road and keep it there. If not, a large gap would form and threaten both Field and Kershaw's divisions. Perry did so, but they began to take fire from the woods to their left. If something wasn't done, then they would have to fall back too, just like Gregg and Benning. So, Perry dispatched the 15th Alabama into the woods to hit the Union soldiers in the flank. Those Union soldiers to be subject to the flanking fire were two heavy artillery units, turned into infantry because of a need for more troops. The brigade made up of the 15th and 6th New York Heavy Artillery were huge compared to other units on the field. With just two regiments, the brigade outnumbered Perry's 5 regiment brigade 2 to 1. The 450 men in the 15th Alabama under William C. Oates charged the large regiments, causing them to scatter. The blue soldiers were inexperienced, mostly seeing guard duty around the defenses of Washington, D.C. The veteran Alabamians dealt with them quickly, losing only one man killed and 11 wounded. Along the road, the 4th and 47th Alabama ran into the single regiment of the 37th Massachusetts. The rest of the brigade, commanded by Eustace, halted, but the Bay Staters didn't get the order and advanced anyway. The blue soldiers fell back since they were alone and their flanks got overlapped by the rebel regiments. However, three regiments of Carroll's brigade attacked the Alabamians, driving them back to some breastworks thrown up by E.P. Hill's men the previous day. Carroll's men were now too far ahead of their own lines, and a quick counterstrike by Perry's men sent the bluecoats back into the wilderness. To Perry's left, the three regiments on that flank were encountering stiff resistance. Oates again took the 15th Alabama to the flank of Wadsworth's brigades and fired repeated volleys into their flank. The gunfire was too much for the men, and the division began to give way. South of the road, Bryan, Hennigan, and Humphrey's brigades were advancing slowly, but pushing the Federals away from their sector. But Lewis Grant's Vermont brigade held on, even with their flanks pulling back. Some comrades across the road fired into the flank of Humphreys, which prevented them from being completely surrounded. Webb's brigade had emerged from the Brock Road, ordered to that sector, but couldn't find the units they were supposed to support. They ran into Perry's brigade and were sent back before they did any major fighting. A lull finally covered the battlefield as each side threw up breastworks. General Lee's army had been saved by Longstreet's corps making it to the field and throwing back the Federal attack on the Plank Road. However, the day was young. It was just a little after 8 o'clock, and there would be more fighting to do.